Hi, and welcome back to PDA Dad UK. In this episode, I get to interview the fantastic Beverly Waters from the Tess Sen Show, which is happening in London this week. Absolutely fantastic event aimed at carers and parents, as well as professional educators. So welcome back to PDA Dad UK. Before we go on, please do go hit like, hit subscribe, ring the bell. It makes a huge difference to me. It just means this gets out to more people. And if you think this is something worth sharing, please do so. As I said before, I'll be interviewing the fantastic Beverly Waters, myself and Martin Dugan from the Grumpy Gits. We uh, got together with Beverly. We are both, uh, as well as Adam Pearson, we're going to be all speaking at the test event this week. And it is a fantastic event. I was privileged enough to be part of it last year. And it's just fantastic to see educators working with parents and carers and other professionals to really make a difference for SEND education and reaching SEND kids and meeting them where they're at and supporting them in their journeys and their lives. It's absolutely fantastic. This is an interview we did for The Grumpy Gits. This is the full interview. We've got an edited down version over on The Grumpy Gits. Do check it out. But uh, for this, this is the full interview with Beverly. So I will hand over to that now. Here with Martin and, of course, the fantastic Beverly Waters from the Test Send Show. Beverly, how are you doing today? Uh, well, it's been an absolutely stressful couple of weeks running up to the show, but <laughs> I'm absolutely loving it. There's so much that's coming up, so much uh, exciting content and activity on the exhibition floor is just going to be amazing. So I'm rushed off my feet, but wanted to come in and say hi to you guys. If I'm someone who's coming to this show, Right, and I wanted to pick out one thing that would get the blood pumping and get me excited, right? What would be the number one thing that you would tell me about to get me excited about the show coming up? That's like asking me to pick my favourite child. Who yeah. is your favourite child? I was meaning to ask that. <laughs> yeah, it's your favourite child, because let's be honest, we've even we've all got favourites. So let's <laughs> I've only got I've only got one. That's the only yeah. thing. That keeps the choice simple, I suppose. Still don't have to pick them though. <laughs> Take somebody else's child. <laughs> the nice one down the road. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, of course, I've got to mention the Parent Care and Teacher Forum and the amazing, uh, you know, Duncan Caspin that's going to be chairing the forum and yourself, Martin, and yeah. um, Adam as well. You know, it's going to be a really exciting session. And we've got the IATA, I think it is, that, that are going to be doing a talk with Duncan and yourselves about physical activity and sport in SEND because you know it's the kind of thing that mainstream schools probably wouldn't talk about and wouldn't want to get and get into because they think the perception is that we're not doing enough so they yeah. tend not to address it so I'm really looking forward to seeing how that's going to pan out on the Saturday morning we've also got the fantastic Tracy Pacquiao Malloway who's coming all the way over from Florida who's going to do some talks on working memory. And Tracy is so inspirational. And she's going to be doing that. I'm going to be chairing that session. And we're going to have Marie Gentles in there as well. So they're both uh, TV uh, presenters, stroke TV um, content providers. So that session is going to be really good on Saturday morning. And that's these sessions are free. So the keynote on the Saturday morning is free. The Parent Care Teacher Forum is free. We have the keynote on the Friday morning. You want me to go on? There's still so much more. There's the poetry competition with Michael Rosen. I'm just interested in this poetry competition because I want to find out just a wee bit more about it. Michael Rosen, for me, I worked in children's telly for quite some time and he's a firm favourite amongst young young readers and he's well known. Uh, just speak to us a little bit about you know, what the poetry competition is and what you're hoping for people to do. Poetry competition we introduced a couple of years ago because I've always wanted to make sure that children and people have a voice of their own. And it was the 2012 Olympics that inspired me to... The narrative was changed by the Olympics. You know, the, the whole nation got an interest in Paralympics mm. and in special needs. And I just wanted the opportunity for um, children to be able to say, to, to change the narrative for themselves, to build it for their, for their uh, generation, to talk about what special needs means to them. So we introduced the poetry competition as a vehicle for schools to talk to children about special needs and to get whole schools talking about it. The teacher will introduce the topic of special needs and ask children about that you know what they know about it who they know 
that has special needs and um, whether they how they interact with them. And that's what the poetry competition is about. It's talking about um, in a positive light rather than just talking about special needs when little Jimmy has to leave the classroom for extra support, but talking about it positively and acknowledging the needs of, of all children. The first year turned into a competition where people were just crying out for help. People were talking about how they felt, how how being in the classroom with other kids makes them feel, how being in the playground makes them feel. And it was really, really quite sad to hear that these children didn't really have another outlet or an outlet that they felt um, they could um, share their stories with. But they did quite honestly and openly with a poetry competition. And nine times out of 10, all of those poems that may have started negatively or ended up being positive. So they were able to talk about their needs, the needs of those around them. So it might not, the child might not have had po um, special needs themselves, but we were just asking them to talk about their understanding of special needs. Mm. So the children themselves were picking out the um, unique points and the special skills that those children had and how wonderful they were. And that's what excited me. That's what really got me into the poetry competition and made me realise just how much work it was doing. And that's one of the things, I mean, I genuinely, I obviously got involved with the Test Sand Show last year and that was my first year being involved. And I'm so happy you're going back. So. And you're now stuck doing it for the rest of your life, Duncan. Yeah, Yeah, that's right. We're that's not funny. letting you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You might have to talk to my wife now. <laughs> I had such a positive time there. And I think the unique thing about this above anything else is that its origins were based in educators wanting to do more to support Sand Kids and realising that there was nothing out there doing it, so they did it themselves. And what you talk about with the poetry competition there, it's bringing in, in something we're big on with the Grumpy Gits in particular, is this idea that don't talk over a community, give them a voice. I, you, you made me think of Eva Abley, who's a friend of the show. She's been on a couple of times. We did a, a, have done a few things with her. But that whole thing of, you know, you were saying about the, the struggles in the playground and that sort of stuff, and that's what she was experiencing. She talks about it quite openly. Mm. And comedy gave her, it was, it was a reason that people had to stop and listen and get past the fact that her speech is a bit slower and things like that. And it's just remarkable. So, again, it's giving that voice. I think it's brilliant. We will always try and accommodate the needs of of everybody that, that's sending in a poem and Michael Rosen is absolutely brilliant at he will he will read them in character uh, which resonates with me because when I remember when I was reading poems to my son when he was little or the or the the Mr Men books I would read them in voices or in little characters and Michael does that with the children and he really brings their poems to 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 life. I mean, even wh whether they've won or not, it's really it's always nice to hear Michael Rosen reading your poem with the expressive language that he has and the the way yeah. that he, he communicates to the young people. So we were so pleased that he decided to come back this year and wanted to present the the awards at the show. So that's a big feature and a big tick for a lot of people coming to the show is coming to hear Michael Rosen and you know, having the opportunity to have a signed book by Michael Rosen, because he will be autographing books and talking to the public. And he's also delivering a, a poetry workshop on the Saturday as well. So and that's free of charge to anybody that wants to come along. Good news is we will be talking to Michael at the show on the Grumpy Gits as well. We've got a, yes. in the middle of sorting that out, but that's going to be a great chance to talk to him in a bit more detail about that. Other areas of the show, I mean, you already talked about, obviously, I'm involved with the Parent Care of, uh, Teacher Forum. I was so happy last year because somebody had said to me, I won't say who, but somebody had said, look, be careful because you're going to find it's going to be 95% parents. For some reason, the educators don't get involved. And I was like, oh, okay, well. But I, I very early on did a thing like a hand check. Who, who is actually a professional? Who's, and well over half the people there were educators. Mm -hmm. and that was, to me, really just a beautiful thing because that's the, the bridge that's Sort of trying to gap there, isn't it? And what's going to, what's particularly for you is going to be special about the parent care, uh, the parent care teacher forum this year? I think, I mean, we've got a brilliant story from um, Sarah Jane Critchley and her daughter Beth. Um, Sarah Jane's been working on the parent care teacher forum for a number of years. 
and um, had developed her own business because of the work that she was doing. She formerly worked for Autism Education Trust. So she has a long history. In the summer holidays, I noticed that because she's a friend of mine, a lot of the speakers in the program and a lot of the exhibitors are people I've known for years and a friend. So Sarah Jane's feed was on Facebook and her daughter's graduation pictures came up. And I thought, how brilliant Beth's graduated because for years I've known Sarah Jane and she's talked about preparing Beth for independence, preparing her for university. Uh, so I've invited them both to come along to the Parent Care and Teacher Forum to talk about how all the preparations that, that Sarah Jane's been putting in for years, whether she actually got it right, what worked, what didn't. But then also Beth's going to come and talk to us to, to tell us from her experience what worked and what didn't, which will be interesting. <laughs> Yeah. For the two of them, I should imagine. And and Beth will be able to say to professionals as well, um, what helped her and what would have helped her as well. So there's there's a there's a huge amount of learning, I think, to be got from that discussion for the Parent Care and Teacher Forum. There's there's a number of other sessions that are taking place. Within the show, we've also got the leadership summit and we've got the Association of School and College Leaders who we're working in partnership with to de- deliver the leadership summit. And that the leadership summit came about because again we were listening to our audience who were telling us that you know it's great that you've got the show for us we're learning practical um, lessons how to interact with how to involve how to you know not alienate children in our classrooms but those that are in charge within schools and education settings they need to understand the issues that we're dealing with, how we're coping. And we were getting this quite a lot. So we put on a leadership conference. So to give leaders the space and the time to network, to talk about the strategic issues that they need to put in place to make sure that schools are inclusive places to work for the children and their staff as well. Mm -hmm. So the Leadership Summit is taking place this year, and I'm really excited about that being led by Margaret Mulholland, who is an advisor to ASCL. She's one of the lead um, members of staff at at the Association of School and College Leaders. We've got so many requests to deliver presentations from exhibitors that we've had to include another theatre. When you walk into the building, there'll be two theatres of uh, presentations where people are talking about all the exciting resources and information that's available to teaching professionals to parents and carers to help in your day-to-day work, in your day-to-day struggles with whatever issues that you have. And um, I'm going to issue a challenge to the audience now. If you come along to the show and you're looking for something that you don't find, please come and tell us because we'd really like to know for next year where we need to focus our attention. What what are we missing? Uh, We're always looking to learn about Um, how we can improve the show how we can develop it this year it's going to be jam-packed and we hope that you're going to get something from it something positive and if you've got any other things you want to put on there chuck them in the comments as well we'll make sure they all get through to um beverly and beverly what's the feedback like from when you've had these test shows what's been the sort of feedback from people on the ground afterwards like teachers and and pupils and leaders and parents like have you had what kind of positive or or any kind of feedback do you get because they must learn a lot in these shows and take a lot away like you're saying we want people to tell us sort of what we can improve on and what we can work on what we can make better for next year but what's the feedback like when the show's ended and everyone's away back to doing what they have to do to make the world a better place well i always know an event has gone well when the only thing they complain about is catering (laughs) the feedback that i'm particularly interested in is what is it that people want to listen to next year Mm. what are the topics what are the issues as well we get lots of anecdotal feedback about the sector about what's happening in people's schools people absolutely love to come and network they like to come and talk to other professionals in a similar setting one of our main targets is for senkos and head teachers And often in a school, they're the only member of staff at that level with that role. Whereas you might have, you know, a couple of geography teachers or a maths teacher or somebody else that's sharing in in English. Whereas there is only ever 
I mean, you've got these big um, mats now, multi-academy trusts that have got SENCOs and deputy SENCOs, but essentially there is one person in that role. So to come along to a show and meet 3,000 other SENCOs is just amazing Mm. because you can talk to you know the speakers in the sessions and say and talk about your situation or your setting and then find that five other people in the room have you know had the same situation and then they meet for coffee and go and talk about it if you're in a seminar please put your hand up ask questions talk to the speakers and after the session as well there's always a short period of time where you can go and talk to each of the speakers most of them will give you their contact details and come and talk to you afterwards or contact you afterwards so um so yeah it's it's the the seminar sessions the exhibition floor as well um the range of exhibitors that we have people often say is absolutely brilliant money thing as well isn't it like for a lot of these senkos and a lot of these schools and a lot of where the money gets distributed and where it goes Mm. because as far as my understanding is it's even though you can apply for money in terms of for the purposes to help kids with special educational needs you don't have to spend it on that am i right yeah yeah that's right or or they're very kind of loose on where they have to put the money so these schools can get that money then they can put it towards something else that they think is more important am i right years and years and years ago um the stn funding would be ring fenced and it hasn't been ring fenced for so long I Um, do you know why do you know why it's not been ring fenced I, i don't maybe that's a question we need to ask the dfe um, yeah, I think it is because there's another side to that, which is that it's something I only discovered this year. When people are applying for EHCPs, when schools put them forward, they're responsible for the first six thousand pounds to be covered mm. by any EHCP. Yeah, yeah. Why people are struggling so much to get each EHCPs put through because the schools just can't afford it. But then you hear about these amounts of money that aren't being ring fenced and are being used somewhere else, and it raises mm. a lot of questions. It does. I mean, and I mean, I I don't know the reason. Um, I know that there are pros and cons so that if if the funding isn't ring fenced, it means that some of the funding um, that is used or could be used more broadly in the school could be focused on SEN. Um, I think what Duncan was alluding to, I'm sorry, Martin was in, alluding to was that the funding that we that schools do get, you could use, for example, I've heard of schools where there's a group of young girls who were always really quite energetic in lessons and that were uh, identified as having um, ADHD and the school were really, really struggling to try and keep those young ladies focused in their lessons. So somebody came up with the idea of, of using some funding from school to pay for a gym membership that these girls went to before school. So from 7 a.m. in the morning, they would go to the gym they would burn off energy, it would keep them fit and well and help them to focus when they got into school. Positive extreme methods like sending your pupils who are energetic to the gym before they get into your class. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many schools would ever think about using their money for that. But Those are some of the areas that, that schools can spend funding on um, yeah. that is not what you would expect it to be. Well, my daughter's know. school is a SEN school, and one of the things they do is they have animals on site. Mm. So there's dogs that hang around, and it's like they're, they're yeah. kept from the classroom most of the time, but they find it a really useful tool is that once somebody, if somebody's dysregulated, if their anxiety's peaking, if opposed mm. to you know, triggering to meltdown, take them to one of the dogs, give them a, po- a, a, a stroke, a pat, and, you know... It does amazing things. It's really interesting. We've got we've got guide dogs for the blind who are coming to exhibit to at the show, and so when there are dogs in school, I suppose it it makes you know the dog that's supporting the child, um, it makes them a bit of a, a center of attention as well because the child will then get uh, their profile will be raised, and it's it's looking at those little things that that just kind of make somebody feel a little bit more welcome, a little bit more part of the school day and the part of the school it's that thing isn't it it's that thing of inclusion and i know there's a loose sort of theme over this moment because it was something that's so prevalent in society at the moment and a lot of tvs focusing on it and stuff like that i literally just finished watching the wrexham episode which focused on autism and and uh that sort of things in, inclusion's a big thing but it's how is it practically and what does inclusion really look like I've, 
Martin yeah. and I have discussed before about the, you know, The Apprentice did that shocking episode of trying to do inclusion videos. And well, they were so far from the mark. Even if you looked at Vanessa D'Souza, who was part of MasterChef, yes. like she was talking about cooking as someone who's got autism and how the BBC didn't really want to touch upon that, really, but she really struggled when it came to foods touching other food. Well, it's always good to see someone in MasterChef who can actually cook as well, isn't it? Yeah, well, I, well apart from Adam. Adam, yeah. <laughs> I seen him actually during the disability expo try to use a blender and it was dangerous. Yeah. I thought he was going to acquire a new disability, to be honest. My girlfriend was asking as a teacher is because she's never been to the test show. So as a teacher, as an educator, as someone who um really kind of struggles with the SEN aspect, because in her her world at the moment, sometimes she can have five SEN kids mm. in her class and one Senko for the whole school. She won't know in advance necessarily. No, she doesn't. No, no, she doesn't. She only finds out as she's educating them, yeah, really. Yeah. And it, what it seems <clears> like is that it seems like there's a real sort of gap between diagnosed kids that have been diagnosed with certain things. They don't know, so they don't have the medication. And by the time they mm. get it, it's all gone. Is it, I mean, what I mean, I suppose her question is. Why would an educator want to go to something like this when they feel like any yeah. money's not there and, and all that kind of stuff? What would you say to any teachers or any educators out there who are really feeling like, what's the point? Do you know what I mean? What is the actual point? Because I might be able to meet somebody in my position, but is it going to change yeah. my, my world in terms of, of the, what's going on in my school with SEN? I think it comes back to that networking opportunity. So you might meet somebody and talk to someone who has a different need for being there than you do but you can then learn a little bit from them and it might be that you stay in touch with those networks um i mean the the reason i got involved with test center was when i was working for nason and nason used to have um like um regional offices um membership offices so locally you could meet up so the opportunity is for people to develop those networks themselves, but also to go along to those sessions that they think might be of interest to them further down the line and to know where to get that information from when they need it. There are a number of organisations that will be at the show who um, will be great sources of information. So you, your your girlfriend, your partner might um, the week before find out that she's got a child coming into a classroom next week um that has yeah. special needs and then it's yeah. like how do I find out about hearing impairment who do I talk to having the networks um that derive from contacts communications at the show exhibitors that you might meet um sessions that you might go to that that's when when that sort of pays off as well as providing support for you now in your classroom uh you might know how to you know set up a classroom that's inclusive um, but everybody needs reminders, everybody needs refreshers. Do you feel in schools, like this is a more of a, a newsy, journalistic question that I'm going to ask you now, like in terms of what the wider sort of scope of things, do you feel when it comes to schools, whether there's whether it's a mainstream school with, S, with an SEM sort of curriculum or, or a SENCO, or whether it's a school catered for, for kids that with special education needs, do you feel like it's an afterthought? The difficulty with the test show is that it's an event for the converted. It, it's We're preaching to the converted. People are already acknowledging that they need help. What we need to do is to make sure that as many members of staff as possible have at least some ba basic knowledge. We can't leave it to the Senko anymore. The Senko is the one role that every school legally has to have. Um, but the responsibility is for all teachers. So um, there used to be a, a phrase that was going around a few years ago that it was every teacher is a teacher of special educational needs. You can't leave it to somebody next to you. You can't leave it to the Senko or the head teacher because at the end of the day, that child is going to be in your classroom and you're going to be the one that has to um, support them as well as supporting everybody else in the classroom. The initial training is just not there. I, I had a chance to speak to a teacher who, who yeah. was herself a pda -er, but she was saying she wanted to do the in-depth version of the SEN education part of her teaching degree. Mm. So she had two days, not one, and half of that <laughs> was on how to fill out paperwork. That's the um, sum total. You, you yeah, know, yeah. The, the teachers are hitting the ground. They're, they want to do their best. Yeah. 
they're being limited by what's actually being provided. And that's, I mean, that's for me was what I took away from last year's show and something that really hit me was the positivity that was there. And yeah, well, that's what I was kind of trying to highlight as well, Duncan, was that I wasn't asking you those questions, Beverly, to show you that there was problems. You already know that, but it was more to show why this show is important. It yeah. really is. The feedback I was getting was from people going, oh, you can see how much is needed. But it was mm. inspiring people to, not in that cheesy inspirational way, but genuinely they were feeling... I want to do something more. And they were taking that back to their schools. They and every that. year we we try and make sure that there's something more, something different, something new, because no matter how much you learn today, something is going to change, something is going to develop. Develop the, the profile of our kids with special educational needs is constantly changing. And we need to constantly update our knowledge around special educational re- needs so that so that you know, school staff can provide the support to that child that comes in unexpectedly, at least until you can get that specialist um, guidance from within your school or setting. Absolutely. And I think it's that you said it before, you know, it's, it's continuing to learn and develop it because yeah. the understanding of you know autism, just take that one thing. People's understanding of autism now compared to what it was even a couple of years ago is dramatically mm. different. The understanding of female presentation within autism all that kind of stuff yeah it's it's developing at a rate that if you're yeah. not exposing yourself to this as an educator you are missing out because everything's moving at such a pace and the understandings yeah. are increasing this is what i feel um has changed a lot because i remember when i was going to school and i went to a school for uh pupils with disabilities but we still educated under the mainstream curriculum but even even from that and i was like i don't want to go to that disabled school i don't want to go with them that was my attitude but but even though we're getting educated, I feel like within the six years that I was in high school, from the start to the finish, it changed so dramatically. Uh, only physically disabled, and then very, very quickly it became about special educational needs and autism and ADHD came into the fold, and it really sort of the whole landscape had changed so rapidly. Mm-hmm. Into, and now obviously uh, disabled children are being forced into mainstream environments now at the moment, so that Obviously, the fact that there's less facilities even now. And my daughter could not cope with mainstream. She yeah. Was, yeah. It was a mess. The second she hit her special educational needs school and they understood her needs and had the facilities there to be able to address it in a better way, what a difference. Like, Have you ever had a conversation with Ade Adepatan about his school, school no, years? No, we didn't, we didn't actually. I think his was... He came, his disability was very different to mine with his polio. So um, I've not managed to talk to him about what, what's his sort of take on it. Well, I, I worked with a day, um, he he presented the awards at an award ceremony that was that probably about 10, 15 years ago. And he'd just written a book about his experience and he was in mainstream education. And, but the fact that he was in mainstream was really great because the rest of the kids then, had a taste of a child with with a physical disability and he said that they included him in in everything and they would put him in things like I mean now it's horrific to say it but they would if they were out sort of after school and they were sort of running around and you know collecting in in groups they would put him in a Tesco trolley and and make sure that he was with them they included him that's just part of growing up being in a trolley (laughs) (laughs) Sure, they were jackass before. way before jackass. I think, I, think yeah. more, I think mine was more as the trolley, to be honest. <laughs> about it. So you had a sheltered upbringing compared to Anna, I think. I mean, Devin is Waitrose around here. Waitrose. I, actually think, I actually think I've had a very sheltered life compared to what Addy's been getting up to when he was younger, to be fair. He, he is a, a kind of a good example of that attitude where he had a very normal, straight sort of um, no-nonsense attitude towards yeah, his yeah. when it came to his disability and stuff. And he, he's he got that attitude, doesn't he, all the time of he wants to show people what he's all about and he wants to prove to people that he can do things that people say that he can. That's mm-hmm. what drives that man. That's what makes him get up in the morning. <laughs> pretty sure what it does now. But but no, I, and, and the, the thing is, um, he's he's obviously made that work for him, but not everybody's got that. No, no. And I was going to say, I think it's important for the rest of us to 
to be involved, people who are different to us, because then that's how we learn. And that's partly why I wanted the poetry competition, because it it allows conversation to be had by everybody, those with special needs and those without, about their understanding of it. And then people can correct them, the people in the room who it's impacting on or who has, even if they don't have a special needs themselves, it might be they have a sibling. But if you're talking to them um, in a classroom about the issue, you can educate them from a realistic perspective, not what the government are telling you, not what your teachers are telling you, but you can hear it. And that's why I wanted the poetry competition to frame the narrative for the young people themselves, for them to be talking using the language that they use today to talk about an issue that's real to them, whereas the perception might have been because people were hidden away or not included, that you can't do it and you weren't included because you couldn't, not because you hadn't been given the, uh, you know, the opportunity to. My school, when I was growing up, we, I mean, there was a period where they had a, a group of deaf kids who came in and were trying to be, they were trying to bring them into the mainstream thing. There were, it was, it, there was a real segregation there. And I realised looking back, a lot of the problem was that other people, people like myself, didn't know how to interact and how to overcome that. When you bring that into the mainstream, for, for a lot of people, that's going to really help. Because if you're exposed to these differences that people have, it destigmatizes mm -hmm. it and takes away that awkward... I, I talk to so many people who say, it's, it's not that I'm prejudiced. I just, I get so worried about am I going to say something wrong? Am I going to say it the wrong way? Am I going to say the wrong thing? Are they going to be? And it's the worry about being offensive causes almost them to be offensive. And it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a that vicious cycle, isn't it? Yeah. But I think what I'm looking forward to from this show this year is that I'm looking forward to being educated, to be honest. So, of course, we're going to be cheering. We're going to be involved. But I think that for me, I'm like you said, Beverly, that networking and that meeting people and that, that um I'm just hope I'm hoping to widen my scope when it comes to understanding because mm. you know if I look back at my school years then I've got a very set way of thinking about my education and what worked for me and what didn't and yeah and why, why it didn't but actually learning from other people at the moment just in terms of the landscape and seeing what's out there and seeing what can be done is really exciting for me. I mean, a great part of the Parent Care Teaching Forum is that when we were setting that up, we realised that often parents and carers don't feel confident enough to come into school and ask questions or to challenge the teachers, partly because of their own experience within the education sector. And um, and when they were at school, if they didn't have a positive experience, and it might be that because their child now has been identified with dyslexia or with autism, they didn't realise as parents that they actually had the same difficulty but they're seeing it manifested in their children so it, it causes the parents anxiety so the parent care teacher forum was set up to allow parents to approach the professionals off the school premises away from the the areas that made them anxious in and to be in an environment where they felt at equal with the, with the teachers or with the professionals and often the professionals that we have in that area are themselves parents of children with yeah. special needs so we've got sarah jane there who's who's you know going to give a brilliant talk with her daughter beth we've got duncan there who can always empathize and uh and uh you know share his experiences uh and, and it's really great that that people like duncan are out there who are willing to to talk about their experiences and the support and the advocacy that that they give? I think we need as many different people with from different backgrounds with different experiences, sharing those experiences and educating everybody around them. There is no one silver bullet. There is no one solution. But Tess Sencho is a great way to start. It's a great way to experience or to just get your first knowledge and understanding about different issues i've had to learn so much about the show and about the issues that impact our audience uh, and i just find it absolutely fascinating well hopefully we, we change everything going forward that's the plan is to make yeah. last year was astonishing and i'm i'm quite certain this year's gonna outdo it even more 
we will put links in the description so you can sign up to get to the event and um, find out all the details. It's in a couple of weeks' time. So check that out now. Beverly, I can't thank you enough for joining us and sharing your insights. Thank you for, for thank you for having me. I'm always um, really nervous about coming on to to talk about the show, but um, but you always put me at my ease, and uh, and I always have a great time and go off in tangents that that weren't planned, which is you what really we've done today. We love our tangents on this show. We, we love for the tangents. It's fine. We love for those tangents are so much more interesting. Yes. <laughs> well, it. thank you very much. You're very welcome. Isn't she amazing and isn't the show just incredible it's an absolute privilege to have been involved with it all the links will be in the description to register and attend the event please do go check it out please do go hit like hit subscribe ring the bell you'll always know when i've got new content coming on and as i said before it just really really helps to get this out there to the people who need to see it please do leave a comment if you've got any information or advice or feedback you'd like us to pass on to beverly please put it in the comments or messages we will get those over to her and it will make a big difference to improving the show year on year. I will see you again on the next episode. In the meantime, please do stay safe.